Okay, thank you very much. I want to start by acknowledging my co-authors. Uh, David Sampson's a postdoc in my group. Um, and Andrew Crystal is in uh, Duke Medicine and Duke in the psych psychiatry department. If you're lucky, you'll spend one third of your life asleep. And that's pretty incredible if you think about it. Uh, because when we're asleep, we're not doing things that we usually think are important for our survival or reproductive success, right? We're not searching for food or watching for predators. Um, or raising offspring or searching for mates. It's also incredible because all animals studied uh, show some signs of sleep. So birds do it, bees do it, jellyfish are, have been shown to sleep, uh, even fruit flies have been shown to sleep and are really becoming a model system in studying sleep. Now, at an at approximate level, we know why we sleep, right? We, there, there are complex neurophysiological mechanisms that happen that lead us to feel tired, and the longer we go without sleep, the more we need sleep. But why has sleep evolved? And uh, more specifically, what is the evolutionary context in which our sleep patterns have evolved? Uh, this is a very important question because we know that sleep is critical for our mental and physical health. And it's also important because more than 70 million Americans suffer from a sleep disorder, and of course vastly more around the world. Uh, this slide shows a graph of a normal night's sleep, okay? And so you have about eight hours of time here. And when you go to sleep tonight, you will go into non-REM sleep first, the lighter stages of non-rapid eye movement sleep, and then into slow wave sleep, a deeper stage of non-REM sleep. Um, you'll then actually arouse out of those deeper stages of non-REM sleep and go into REM, rapid eye movement sleep, when the most dreaming occurs. Um, and many people will actually arouse briefly um, after that bout or before the bout of REM sleep. And then the cycle continues. You go through another cycle of that. The cycle length is about 90 minutes to two hours, okay, on average. And we repeat this process through an eight hour period. Now I want to raise three questions about this. Uh, first of all, how normal is this? Is this really the way Humans have been sleeping um, before electricity and, and soft beds and, and the lifestyles that we have today. Um, how does human sleep differ from other primates? Is there anything unique about our sleep compared to other primates? And then finally, how does evolution inform understanding of sleep disorders? Uh, so here's an outline. I'll talk about variation in mammalian sleep, focusing especially on um, on uh, duration of sleep. Uh, then I'll talk about sleep in the great apes. How is sleep in great apes different from sleep in other primates? And then sleep in humans. How is sleep in humans different from other great apes? Uh, so I've been part, a part of a big effort to compile a database called the Phylogeny of Sleep Database um, in which we go to the literature and obtain data on sleeping patterns uh, for many different species. And we have over 127 mammalian species in this database, an average of nine individuals per species. Um, and we collect data on many different variables. The total sleep duration. Uh, if it's EEG data, we can get data on REM sleep and non-REM sleep. Uh, the cycle length that I just talked about, that cycling between the two different states. Um, whether animals are monophasic, whether sleep is all consolidated into one bout, or whether it's polyphasic. And, and uh, spread throughout uh, multiple sleep bouts throughout a 24-hour period. And what we find, as other people have shown as well, is there's incredible variation in sleep durations across, um, across mammals. Uh, so we have some real expert sleepers, like this bat that spends most of its day asleep, right? And others, like the giraffe, that spend very little time in sleep. And, and you know, if you, if you slept like that, you might not spend a whole lot of time sleeping either, okay? And that's in REM sleep for the giraffe. Um, and so uh, just to give you a sense of the, how we use these data, I'll focus in on sleep durations, uh, as you just saw. What, and, and the question is, what explains this variation in sleep durations across mammals? And my colleagues and I, uh, in the work that we've done on this, have grouped the hypotheses into two different categories. There are ecological hypotheses that focus on ecological constraints on sleep. Uh, that limit the amount of time animals have to sleep. And then there are functional hypotheses that focus on the proposed benefits of sleep, you know, often viewing sleep as being something for the brain, right? Um, but there are other functional hypotheses as well. 
And we, we find more evidence for the ecological constraints on sleep architecture, sleep duration, and other characteristics than we do for the functional benefits. So here are some of the results involving predation risk. And this is predation risk uh, coded um, at the sleep site by multiple people on the team, and then we, uh, we average those. And this is showing evolutionary transitions uh, on the tree to increases in exposure at the sleep site. And what you can see is that evolutionary increases in exposure lead to less time in non-REM sleep and less time in REM sleep. Okay, so predation risk is one factor. And likewise, if we look at trophic level, we see similar results. Herbivores sleep less than carnivores. Okay, they're at greater risk. Now, conversely, if we look at some of the functional hypotheses, and brain size would be one of the obvious ones to look at uh, if sleep is doing something for the brain. And so people have proposed that uh, animals with a larger brain may spend more time sleeping. Uh, when we use phylogenetic comparative methods and, and uh, control for conditions of how the, uh, the, the data on sleep are collected, we find no significant association between sleep duration and relative brain size. We've also looked at particular regions of the brain, and again, we find no association. For example, with hippocampus volume, a place where uh, many spatial memories uh, reside. There are some indications with the amygdala that uh, amygdala volume and non-REM sleep uh, co-vary positively, but you can see it's not the most compelling uh, association. Um, and so in general, we find that there's better evidence for ecological constraints on these gross measures of sleep architecture uh, than uh, evidence for functional benefits. Okay, so I'll move on now to sleep in the great apes. Um, and this is a slide I often show my students. Uh, what is the, and a question I ask them, what is the one behavioral trait uh, that unites the great apes to the exclusion of all other primates? And the answer is that we build nests or beds uh, to sleep in every night, complex nests or beds that we can then lie down in. Uh, so um, other anthropoid primates, monkeys, and gibbons sleep in a more crouched position uh, on, the, on a tree or on a cliff face or wherever they might be sleeping, uh, whereas the apes really produce a, a nest that they can lie down in. And so people have proposed, well, sleeping platforms might be important for the greater cognitive abilities in the great apes, that it might be important for acquiring these benefits, the functional benefits of sleep. And so, of course, it could be that sleep depth is more important than sleep duration uh, when we think about these kind of functional benefits. And maybe having a soft bed to sleep in, or at least a flat bed to sleep in, like this chimpanzee nest, can help you achieve deeper sleep, especially for REM sleep, okay, when the body is paralyzed. Uh, so the postdoc in my lab, David Sampson, has been investigating this in his, in his PhD work and is now continuing this work with me um, at Duke. Um, and th these are some of the findings that uh, he has. The, this is uh, work he did at the Indiana Zoo. Uh, here's a baboon sleeping in that crouched position I described. Here's an orangutan, okay? The orangutans sleep like us. He gives them materials uh, that they can use to build a nest at night. You know, so this animal set would lay out this blanket. The animal did this, okay, not the keeper. Lays out the blanket, lies down in it, okay? And what David has shown is that the baboon has higher motor activity over the course of the night than the, baboon, than the orangutan. Um, but even more importantly, the sleep fragmentation measures are higher for the baboon than the orangutan. So the great apes have, based on this, have deeper, more efficient sleep than monkeys. Um, and likewise, he can give them different materials to uh, build their nest with and come up with a sleep comfort index. You know, so this is just straw, okay? And he has foam mattresses and blankets and all kinds of other things that he can give them to build a, a better nest, okay? And what he shows is, is that sleep fragmentation is lower when they have more materials um, to use in their nests. And then also he's shown that they have overall higher overall accuracy in an artificial grammar task after nights when they can sleep with more of these materials and build a better nest. So bedding increases sleep quality and the next day cognitive performance in orangutans. Okay, so what about sleep in humans? Uh, we are a great ape, we build nests, of course, we sleep in a bed, um, but there are some other differences and we wanna propose three uh, differences 
Uh, and so there are probably more, but here are three that we think are important and relevant um, uh, between humans and other primates, uh, especially other great apes, but other primates in general. Um, first of all, we want to propose that natural human sleep uh, may be more flexible uh, than in other great apes. And there's several lines of evidence for this. Uh, some comes from, the, uh, from studies of hunter-gatherers and the ethnographic record. Um, here's uh, one quote from uh, Daniel Everett's study of the Paraha. Paraha take naps uh, 15 minutes to two hours at the extremes during the day and night. There's loud talking in the village all night long. Consequently, it's very difficult for outsiders to sleep well among the Paraha. Or in Carol Worthman's review of sleep in the ethnographic record, human nights are filled with activity and significance, and nowhere do people typically sleep from evening to dawn. Um, many of you might know, uh, continuing along this line, many of you might know this book by Roger E. Kirch uh, that's gotten a lot of press, um, where he looks through the historical record over three millennia in, in European uh, cultures, societies, and he finds many historical references to a first sleep and a second sleep and documented activity between those sleep periods, suggesting that humans, it, and, uh, without access to easy access to artificial light, have segmented sleep and actually are sleeping in two phases, were sleeping in two phases. Um, and likewise, experimental studies reveal this. Um, in one study by Tom Ware, uh, published in 1992, um, he found that uh, in a low, a short day length uh, period in humans with a natural light setting in America shifted to a biphasic sleep pattern. Okay. Now, other primates show nighttime activity. David Sampson documented that with the orangutans. They actually give loud calls on some nights and things like that. But we want to suggest that humans may be more extreme in this regard, more polyphasic um, than, we, than we may typically think. Now, a second uh, difference um, is one that's sort of surprising uh, to a lot of people, but humans are actually the, uh, we sleep the least of all the primates. And this is shown with this uh, bar chart, and it's actually a pretty conservative bar chart because we have eight and a half hours up here for the, the human, um, and it's more, probably more like seven to eight. Um, and then a third point is we have a higher proportion of REM sleep um, compared to all other primates. And one of the things we do in my lab is uh, try to really understand, we use phylogenetic comparative methods and statistical, statistical approaches to really probe these kinds of questions more quantitatively. And so we've developed techniques to identify whether a species is an outlier, whether it's really more extreme than you would expect. And so we can predict sleep durations in humans based on phylogeny, basically reconstructing a tip of the tree okay, that also includes data on activity period and body mass. So we can predict what human sleep would be based on a statistical model that has activity period that were diurnal and we have a certain body mass and our place on phylogeny. And so in the case of sleep durations, um, this is the posterior probability distribution uh, that we get and human sleep is right here. So we're not an extreme outlier, but we're on the left end of this curve, Sh shorter sleep than you might expect. Here's sleep across all primates. Um, we're on the left end of that. And about 10% of the posterior distribution is less than observed, okay? And in the case of REM percent, we're much more of an outlier. So here is the uh, pro posterior probability distribution and humans on the far right of that. Now, we're also working with Andrew Crystal. Uh, he's a part of our team um, to really bring evolutionary perspectives to human sleep disorders. Um, so as you've already seen, this is one way, the, the work I just showed is one way we're placing human sleep into the broader evolutionary pattern of primate sleep. And then we're using these evolutionary perspectives to shed light on key sleep disorders, such as insomnia, narcolepsy, seasonal affective disorder, circadian rhythm disorders. So for example, in the case of uh, insomnia, many people have middle of the night insomnia, and that may relate to some of the patterns uh, that we see with segmented sleep. And then we're also interested in the global health implications. How do sleep patterns actually change? How are they changing around the world with greater access to artificial lighting? And so we'll be going to Madagascar this summer uh, to study this question in a village uh, that doesn't have access to electricity and uh, good lighting and actually giving them some lighting to see how that changes their sleep patterns. Um, so uh, for some take home messages, looks like I'm about to get kicked off. Uh, mammals exhibit incredible variation in sleep patterns and adaptations uh, for acquiring sleep. Ecology appears to be the primary driver of this variation. 
Uh, great apes are expert nest builders, and this allows deeper sleep. And then we are hypothesizing three differences in humans. Uh, we sleep less, we have a higher percentage of REM sleep, and we're more flexible in our sleep. 